And today we are very excited to have a very good friend of ours from New York City, our friend and colleague, Dr. Emily Splickle. I will let her go ahead and give a little background on who she is. Cool. Thank you, guys. Um, I love Stick Mobility and the team at Stick Mobility. Um, Dr. Splickle, Dr. Emily, you can call me Emily, it doesn't matter. Um, Podiatrist, human movement specialist, educator through EBFA Global. Um, I've written many books about barefoot science, human movement, um, neuroscience. I'm huge on interoception. And then I'm also the founder of Nobosa Technology. Yes, I am uh, reigning from New York right now, but moving to Arizona in a week and a half. So I'm super excited to be a desert muskrat after this. <laughs> and so one of your biggest platforms is really what you referred to as foot to core integration and really and barefoot training so uh we'd like your insight on the importance really of why we need to understand the the function of the feet and how to strengthen the feet i've been speaking about feet or educating about feet since 2010 formally like on a comp uh the conference circuit and when i first started teaching that's 10 years ago now i would speak a little bit more about the foot in isolation because that's first how I initially delved into it as a podiatrist. And then the more that I started getting into fascial lines and um, a lot of pelvic floor and breathing and how complexly integrated the human body is, I knew that I could not be speaking about the foot in isolation. Um, so yes, it's important to strengthen your foot intrinsics, but if your foot is strong and it's not really communicating with or functionally integrated with the rest of your body, kind of who cares that your foot is strong, right? It's kind of like doing just bicep curls, but then you can't, you know, throw a ball or something like that. Um, so the way that I tie in feet with the rest of the body is through fascial lines, um, which connect the feet to the core, which is the foot to core sequencing of everything I speak about. Um, and it really helps to hone in the foundation concept, meaning, you know, your core is stability, core is foundation to stability, pelvic floor, TVA. But if people can understand the analogies between intrinsic foot strength actually connects to intrinsic core strength, it helps people grasp the importance and the concept a little bit easier. Neil and I, we we typically try to get our clients to train barefoot when they're at the gym because for the most part, I think most people, that's really the only time that they'll get out of their shoes. In fact, you were just talking about how you have some clients that don't ever want to get out of their shoes. Yeah. You know, it's like, they just have this, no, I need the shoe. I need the, I need it for support. You know, I have to wear orthotics and you know, who am I to argue against that? Their podiatrist told them to do it. So then they hear their trainer say, Hey, you know, let's strengthen your feet and maybe progress out of orthotics. Now, is, is that something that you can actually do? Can we progress people out of orthotics? Oh, 100%. Majority of my patients, I actually get them out of their orthotics. And what's frustrating for the fitness industry or movement specialists, such as probably majority of people who are listening to this podcast, is that they're trying to tell their clients something that they know is good for them, but they're going against, you know, the white jacket, the doctor's coat that we as society are kind of taught to believe or trust what they're saying. And now I feel that a lot of people are starting to challenge that, which is great. That's good for us. That patients might start saying now, maybe I don't need orthotics. Even though the podiatrist says you need orthotics, they might now be like, no, there's, I, I read about these programs on the internet or my trainer says that I should be in minimal shoes and training barefoot. So they start to kind of challenge that. Um, so 100%, you can train yourself out of orthotics. Are there exceptions to that? Yes, because there's exceptions to literally everything. But can the majority of clients be without orthotics for a controlled period of time, not doing necessarily crazy dynamic exercises? Yes. Yes. I just Googled an article a little earlier today where they were saying, and this was a 2016 article, and they were saying that by 2020, the orthotics revenue overall was going to be over north of $3 billion in the U.S. And that's a yes, lot of money. Even, oh, it's, it's even higher than that, which is 
ridiculous. It is a cash business within podiatry. Chiropractors do orthotics. Physical therapists do orthotics. You probably have some neurologist or kind of kind of a catch-all where they could do it. So you have quite a few professionals who they see that as a revenue generator. So whether the patient or individual really needs it, to you it's it's cash, right? Or it's revenue. I have colleagues that we've been in kind of meetings and conversations and they're just like, literally every patient that comes in the office, they will convince them that they need orthotics because they know that they're making 400 plus dollars off each of those patients or each of those pairs. Wow. So is it not common for podiatrists to tell their patients to really strengthen their feet and potentially get out of their orthotics? Like, are you one of the rare podiatrists out there that do this? I am a rare podiatrist because I don't want to see my patients again meant in the nicest way. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I I, I try to empower them. I think the best analogy to that is I remember being a trainer. Maybe I was like 22, 23, like early trainer for a commercial gym where they're kind of the same business model in a sense, right? Like you need to just like push sessions with your clients, you need your your clients to feel like they need you. And right, so you don't want to like, don't empower them too much. They have to feel like they can't work out without you because you need to, right, kind of, mm-hmm. that's what I remember them saying is like, they have to need you, almost like disempower them. And I'm like, this is such a fucked up philosophy. <laughs> totally. Where <laughs> I, I empower my patients, like get better on your own. You are doing your physical therapy on your no, your own. I'm not doing it, right? Like you have to take your health in your own hands. So I try to get them better so I don't need to see them again. It is a different business model. So I don't get like a recurring revenue off of each patient, right? But mm-hmm. that's fine because <laughs> I'd rather them be better. Um, but yeah, most are not. In that model, in essence, I think is more of if I can improve somebody's quality of life and give them that empowerment, what's going to happen is that person's experience they're going to share with other friends and family members who are probably most likely going to encounter some type of foot discomfort or foot issue down the road. And so they're more apt to say, hey, I had Dr. Emily. She was fantastic. She got me out of the orthotic. That's who you need to go see. So the, the referral is really the most empowering thing there. And that's really uh, getting kind of both industries to maybe look a little differently in their perspective on how to generate business that way. Yeah, 100%. And then if I have a patient that does need a little bit more training or rehab or corrective exercise, whatever you want to call it, I'll send them to people like you guys and say, you need not assembly line physical therapy, right, which is how a lot of physical therapy is, is I'll say, you need a really good trainer who understands the body and the fascial system and breathing and foot to core and like all that stuff. And they're going to give you a really holistic program that's going to just take you beyond just getting a little bit past your knee pain, let's say. Um, So yeah, there's a strong referral basis between medical providers and fitness professionals or movement specialists. And that's that's really a, a business model that everyone who's listening should be taking advantage of. Yeah, because I try to always get younger trainers or coaches and I, I usually give them the advice of, you need to have a great network and your clinicians need to be a solid foundation of that network, but your clinicians need to know what you're bringing to the table, what your philosophy is. And so I think for the trainers out there that are listening, don't be afraid or intimidated to work with a clinician. And I, I think there is a lot of intimidation factor because of that fear of, oh my God, am I doing something incorrect that this clinician is going to call me out on? Well, yeah, the one thing that I will say is that Uh, traditional medical doctors, even like orthopedic. So orthopedic surgeons know surgery really well. Mm -hmm. They may know, you know, the detailed innervation and blood supply and like everything to kind of anatomical, but they don't know the exercises and the complexity of higher level programming that a lot of the listeners are doing that 
um, they shouldn't feel intimidated. I understand it, but they shouldn't feel intimidated. Um, I work with a lot of functional medicine doctors who understand, you know, gut biome and oxidative stress and free radicals and inflammation and a lot of the stuff that a lot of movement specialists know, but they will admit and say, I understand the body's super integrated and we need to think about sleep and all of that stuff. But when it comes to exercise recommendations, I'm lost. Like, I just don't get that side. I don't know how to recommend it to my patients. So I would say if they start going towards a medical specialty that they might feel more confident approaching, like I would go to an endocrinologist if you're a diabetes specialist Mm -hmm. or an oncologist if you're a cancer exercise specialist or, you know, an orthopedist or functional medicine or something like that, like choose a specialty and then give them your information or even offer to train them a free session so they know how you train them or something. And that's a great recommendation. And that's an investment in your business to take that time to give a free session or two so they know what your philosophy or your training regimen is all about. And then they're going to feel much more confident to refer patients out to you as a, as a source of training. So the one thing you both have in common is new, ch- new ba- babies. You just had your first child. And so yeah, my daughter's, Two and a half now, or almost two and a half, but we've got a little boy on the way in about a month. Oh, yeah, back to so. sleepless nights. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, yeah. Is your daughter sleeping all the way uh, the night? Uh, no, not really. She just doesn't want to sleep. I don't understand it. Um, she'll wake energy. up one, one time a night on good nights. Otherwise, now it's the most is two times a night. But you can still speak to uh, Michael, my husband, that both of you know, and he, <laughs> He's the one with the bags under the, his eyes. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's fascinating to see the little ones learning to walk and crawl and like learn the motor coordination and mm-hmm. um, yeah, I didn't I didn't know the subtleties of how fascinated they are with the world. Where my daughter and I'm sure um, you have a daughter, right? Your yeah. two and a half year old daughter. Yeah. Um, how they. Uh, touch everything does your daughter rake things or did uh, she rake things? everything yeah she would i mean she would touch things she'd pick it up bite on it yeah everything yeah. just i'm just fascinated with the touch like everything has to be like my my sensory exploration is through her like the fascination of that i was always big on not putting shoes on her for a really really long time and then just finding the right type of shoes was was tough i wanted to make sure they're really wide you know they weren't super uh, tight and you know if you look at her feet now they're They've, they've been, they're still wide and she's barefoot quite a bit. And like, she'll ask to be barefoot, which is kind of cool. Uh, and I don't know what you're, so I'm sure your daughter's barefoot a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. She is never, according to she's 10 months for, for yeah. listening. So she hasn't really had to, but she's been walking since she was eight and a half months. So she walked early, Yeah. Um, wow. which is just crazy. I mean, she crawled early. She was like doing back handsprings, you know, in my stomach. So she was <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. A little gymnast there. <laughs> we have her hanging on a bar so we can like get her little grip strength. Um, you can see like the obsessional future gymnast mom. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you will be gymnast. Like, I, just, I know I do the same stuff. I'm like, hold on to my hand. <laughs> I know. It's like gym, gymnasts are one of the, uh, the sports, like former gymnasts stereotypically like you can tell when someone's a gymnast like they still stand a certain way like i still will like point my toes when i present at workshops people are people are still like were you a gymnast <laughs> i'm like i would just like constantly so when i had a i knew i was having a girl i was like gymnast yes <laughs> <laughs> bars and balance beams and vaults and like oh <laughs> and what's amazing is like Neil has talked extensively with me about the way he's watched Nova progress through her movements and and just fascinating and, and how you talk about trying to imitate the positions that she gets into. Oh, yeah. I've spent some time on the ground. I'm like, all right, I'm going to try to do everything she does here. You know, she'll get down into like 90-90 position. So then and she's moving around playing with toys and then she'll get out of it in a different way. And I'm like, uh, nope, I can't do that. If I try to do that, my hip would pop out. You know, just the, and then also the, the development of, I guess, of movement where 
they don't really move on to the next step until they feel comfortable and stable. You can, I think you can use that model when you're training your clients, right? Give them that safety, get them to progress from here and then move on to the next step. And kids just do it naturally. I don't tell her how to move. I don't tell her how to walk. I don't tell her how to crawl. She just does it. Yeah. It's really cool to see, yeah, what they do when you see that they become more confident. And it, it happens actually quite quickly. But I remember her first few steps were like really drunk, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like really wide. And then, and she would just fall a ton. And within a week, she would then, her base of stance was narrower. And she would actually like stand on one leg and try to like test like, you know, it would be kind of like a drunken misstep and then she'd be on one leg and she'd catch her, her center of gravity and she'd come back down, which is which is really fascinating to see that. And now she can run, but her running is her Buddha belly. <laughs> out, and then she goes like this. this is like her, her stomach is sticking out and then she does this. You see how my chin is? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> falling it's yeah. just so funny how she tries to find like the stack her center is the belly is sticking out so her head has to come back <laughs> and then she'll it's hilarious so do you think if if we keep our kids barefoot as long as humanly possible we could avoid a lot of the foot issues we have today um i would say not even just foot issues I would say, do we have potentially even cognitive issues or emotional regulation issues? Because a lot of that is, they're so inter interrelated because your sensory feeds motor coordination and motor output and motor development and walking, right? And the more you walk, you just start to get different circulation, cerebral circulation, and then sensory is so important to um, feeling safe and emotional regulation, especially in the earlier stages. And then that lays a foundation to cognitive function and executive function where emotional regulation is important for executive function. And the more you can connect with your body internally and externally, all of that feeds really what I speak on is mood, memory, and movement. So those three areas through sensory is, is so important. So for children, I think Yes, we wouldn't have foot problems, but would you have a different school environment potentially? Do you have any specific brand of shoe that you would recommend for a, for children or like you know they're developing say two three years of age? Yeah, so uh, at Nabo, so we actually work with Splay, so S P L A Y Splay, um, but they start around. I think their children's shoes start around like five years old, four or five years old. So they're a little okay. bit bigger. When you're looking at someone who's more, you know, a year and a half to a couple of years, so you're kind of like more in the toddler phase, we'll say. Um, you know, there are some, Vivo Barefoot makes some, Zero Shoes makes some, Splay makes some, um, Soft Star Shoe has some. There's a couple like new independent ones that I've seen that are really like moccasins. Cool. And so anything that's kind of along the lines of more like a moccasin is what I know I want to put Aurelia in. Um, but I would say as little structure as possible. Cause if you're also thinking of it that let's say if they're walking on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. yeah. as an example, they don't have a lot of impact forces. Right? Like there's not like high ground reaction force that's entering their body. So we need cushion in their shoes. Like there's nothing um, like that. Children are also a lot of cartilage. So you, you really shouldn't be like, I don't want the baby to get a stress fracture. Like there's no bone to stress fracture in the foot. Like it's all cartilage, right? Like you have to kind of think along that lines as well. I would like, and when I eventually start putting shoes on Aurelia, which I want to fight that as long as I can, it will be a moccasin type shoe. When you talk about short footing, can you specifically address what the proper cueing of short foot is? And, and for the listeners out there that don't know what short foot is, can you explain that to them also, please? Yeah, absolutely. So short foot is my go-to exercise that if people are taking a workshop with me and I ask them a trivial pursuit question of any sort, when in doubt, people just answer short foot because they know that <laughs> it's, it's usually what I'm referencing, like what is the best exercise for the feet? Short foot. Um, but yeah, so short foot is a foot engagement exercise that was originally introduced and a lot of the research around it 
is based around just foot strengthening. So you, you do short foot, which I'll explain in a second, and you strengthen the muscles in the feet, and therefore you have strong feet. There you go. And that's, remember in the beginning, I was like, if you have strong feet, but it's not talking to the rest of the body, in my opinion, who cares that you have strong feet? Because it has to be integrated. So short foot exercise not only activates the foot or strengthens the foot muscles, but it activates the core, your deep core stabilizers. And it's via a fascial line, which is your deep front fascial line. So you're able to activate into your core. So foot to core sequencing, the way that you do foot to core sequencing is with short foot. Um, So short foot, the simplest way to describe it would be pushing your toes down into the ground. Really what you're doing is just Mm -hmm. pushing your toes down into the ground. Dr. Yanda, who was the one who first introduced short foot, used to describe it or he described it where you would draw you would draw your metatarsal heads towards your heel so you're Mm -hmm. shortening your foot however doing that motion with the foot like actually drawing it in like that is very difficult to do when you're doing like a plyometric type movement or a box jump and you're doing the quick landing technique and um, so I've actually changed the way that I cue it um, because of the application of it or the, how I apply it, with, especially with um, athletes and stuff like that. So drawing in like that engages the intrinsics or pushing the tips of the toes down into the ground does it. Now, when people, before they do short foot, they set their base. So they find their foot tripod, which is underneath the first metatarsal head, the fifth metatarsal head and the heel. So everyone gets all obsessed over, I must find my tripod. I must center my body weight on my tripod which means that when I do short foot, I should be pushing my tripod into the ground, which is not what you should be doing. So you should not be pushing your first metatarsal head down into the ground because you don't want to drive your head down because directly under it are your sesamoids and you're essentially pushing your sesamoids into the ground and creating a pattern of pushing the sesamoids into the ground, which can create sesamoiditis for people. I've seen a lot of people get sesamoid fractures. Um, So you, you wanna be really careful on that cueing. So really what should happen is that when you push your toes down, your first met head should lift. So you actually come off of your first met head. Um, And then the last thing that I would add with that is that when you when you push your toes down and the first met head lifts or the ball of your foot lifts, it's a reaction to the contraction. So I'm not doing it. It's what's happening when I push my toes down. Does that make sense? Like don't force it up. Um, And then I mean, I have like a thousand corrections to this. Um, And then when it comes to how hard you should be pushing down I tell people around 20% of your max contraction, 20, 25%, right? Mm -hmm. Because you start seeing these people on Instagram, no names mentioned, about (laughs) pushing, (laughs) tell us later, pushing the toes down as hard as you can. And their cueing will be find your foot tripod and then get, you know, spread your toes and then push your toes down as hard as you possibly can. So that you get like the burn in your muscles and you must feel your muscles in your foot engaging and like, like, you know, that, why? And then they, people will write me and be like, I've been doing short foot based off of the recommendation of blah, blah, blah. And now I have plantar fasciitis. I'm like, well, don't oh, wow. push your toes down that hard. <laughs> You're engaging your plantar fascia when you do that. Remembering that it shouldn't be a max contraction. It should be allowing the first metatarsal head to lift. Yes, you find your tripod. Don't push your tripod down. And then make sure that when you're doing short foot, you're engaging your pelvic floor at the same time and you're breathing at the same time, right? So toes go down, pelvic floor goes up, you exhale. So that's the stack of short foot that I try to do. So whether the toes curl or stay straight doesn't matter. Okay, so I prefer to have them stay straight. Okay. And the reason is at, is that the whole purpose of short foot, when you look at the evolution and functional movement, is that it's controlling your foot when it's in a position like this, 
which is a lever, right? So if you're doing a calf raise, if this doesn't make sense to people, if you do a calf raise, the position that your foot is in when you do a calf raise is called a rigid lever. That's the lever of the foot. It's a catapult for you to go forward when you're walking or running, right? Obviously. Yeah. So now when you're doing that, your toes are pushing down, which is short foot. Your foot is a uh, stacked rigid foot for you to release power. So when you're doing that as a lever, you want your digits to be long, straight, and flat on the ground. If you're taking a step and you're in that lever and your toes are doing this, you just lost surface area, like mm -hmm. contact with the ground. So why, why would you want that? To me, it's just physics. At that point, all you're talking about is levers right? Mm -hmm. And you have a longer lever arm, something that has a longer lever arm, you're able to create more torque. Yeah, that's it. Like it's not an it's not even an argument of anatomy, or physiology or fascia or whatever the hell you want to speak about. It's just straight physics and torque. Yeah, because you're not I mean, you can't spring off of this, you're springing off of this. Yeah, right? it's like people with bigger shoe sizes, like foot sizes, they are able to create more torque from their ankle and their Achilles tendon because their foot is larger. You better, you better start wearing bigger shoes now. <laughs> My size six and a half. <laughs> people always are like, your feet are so small. I'm like, I'm five three. How, how big do you think my feet are supposed? I've gotten that my whole life. They're like, your feet are so tiny. I'm not six three. I'm like, I'm five three. <laughs> it's proportional. It's proportional. Right? If I, if I had a size 10 foot, you'd be like, holy bozo the clown. You'd be like, you got clown feet. So I'm like, I'm screwed either way. So yeah, I mean, it's just kind of funny having to yeah. grow up with that. Yeah. No, it actually would. So your lever, because it is proportional. So your yeah. lever and you have an appropriate lever size for your height. Yeah. So it's right. That's the way I, yeah. I that, right? I, I got your back. I got your back. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk a lot about the lack of communication from the proprioceptors of the feet to the brain due to the cushioning or the foam in footwear. Uh, can you kind of explain to the listeners in de more in detail about that? Yeah. So the foot, we want to think of it as a biomechanical structure, meaning like, oh, you have a high arch, you have a low arch, pronate, supinate, like all these things. But you also want to think of it from a sensory perspective, which is really what you're talking about. And from a sensory perspective, the foot is actually much more important sensory wise than biomechanical wise, even though the foot is fascinating biomechanically because of the number of nerve branches that actually have a sensory function. There's 10 times as many sensory nerve functions in the foot than motor, um, which oh. I hope puts it a little bit into perspective. Wow. Um, and then when it comes to sensory nerves in the foot, you have special nerves because the skin of the foot is different than any other part of the body except the palm of your hand. So that glabrous skin, which is what it's called, glabrous skin is different than hairy skin. And so hairy skin has different nerves than glabrous. Glabrous skin has mechanoceptors or tactile receptors that are sensitive to obviously touch. So you're touching texture or two-point discrimination. You're touching what can stimulate skin stretch. You're touching what is perceived as vibration. So ground reaction forces when you hit the ground or impact forces are perceived or sensed by the nervous system as vibration. So that's actually one of the most important ones that are coming in is the perception of vibration or the stimulation of vibration, which actually makes up 70% of the mechanoceptors in the feet, 70%, um, which makes it obviously the most important one that's coming in. If you have cushion in your shoes, you obviously are not going to feel texture and two-point discrimination or skin stretch because you're in a shoe. And then vibration gets absorbed by the cushion, which means that all of the information is not getting into your nervous system in your brain. It's being absorbed by the shoe and you create a disconnect. Um, can you still move and walk? Of course, right? Your, your nervous yeah. system is very intelligent. The nervous system is designed for survival, which means that if, if 
I lose um, 50% of the strength in my right arm, I will make up for it in my left arm. My left arm might, or my right arm might completely hypertrophy because I'm making up that difference. Um, same thing with like circulation. If I lose uh, circulation through one of my arteries because it's clogged, your body creates collateral circulation, like new blood vessels around where you have the clot or the, the plaque, right? So if I do not get information from the ground, your body figures out how to walk and do high performing activities with not all of the information that's potentially at its disposal. And that's why when people get neuropathy, they lose balance, right? Yeah. If you look at someone who has neuropathy, diabetes is the most common, diabetic neuropathy, right? So if you have two patients or two clients, they're the same age, both of them have diabetes, but one has neuropathy and the other doesn't. The one that has neuropathy is 15 times greater risk of falling, which wow. is yeah. huge. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and that kind of brings us to our mutual friendship, Morton. And he w- he told us when we first met him a long time ago. He was like, you know, I've got all these athletes, and they're they're strong, they're powerful, they're explosive, but they've got sacks of mashed potatoes at the end of their legs. And when he said that to us, it was really just powerful uh, in that statement. And and then it was kind of the thought process of how much better could they be if their feet were better and you've done work with the NFL and, and, and can you kind of tell your experience on how that's gone? Yeah, hundred percent. So um, I've always wanted to get increased foot awareness in shod sports, any, any of them, football, soccer, hockey, um, skiing, whatever, all old sports, basketball. Um, just because if, If you're taking them from children in shoes and then to high school and then collegiate and the professional and the entire time that they're, they're trained on a philosophy of not really ever connecting to their feet. It's no fault to the coaches or the trainers, because if they don't know, you, you don't know what you don't know. Essentially when you're used to working with barefoot sports. So I've worked a lot with dancers, um, martial artists, Uh, gymnast. I was a gymnast myself for 13 years, so I appreciate barefoot movement. And you see the subtleties in how they move versus how a shod athlete moves with the the subtleties in grace and elegance and, you know, kind of things like that. And they also have different injury patterns then that when I was given the opportunity to meet with some of the NFL teams and go there and actually assess some of their athletes and speak to the athletic trainers and speak to the physical therapy department with them um, and speak to the strength coaches and such that they were initially skeptical Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then started to see the effects of it. And then I feel now things are more and more kind of being a little bit more open to it. That's less of a a hill for me to climb to try to break some of those barriers. But I don't think that they're anywhere near where they need to be. There's definitely an appreciation. I think there's then the reality of how do they get these athletes to do it, where I've been speaking at NSCA conferences, like the national conferences for years, uh, like eight years. And every time I would speak, on the same topic. Um, and I would almost say like, if you're not doing any sort of barefoot foot sensory stimulation for your athletes and you see all of the data, then that's on you. Like somehow we have to get this built into it. And they would come up to me and just be like, how do I navigate all these athletes rushing in? And then they have, you know, bare feet have germs and gross and athletes foot. And there's like a cleanliness thing to it and then there's an odor and then there's sweat and then they're big guys and then they just are on a time clock so they got to do shit like scheduled fast i think that's part of the reality of it but where we've seen the greatest success is the athletes that take it upon themselves as well so we are in some of the mlp pitchers shoes they took it on themselves they have they use their naboso insoles in their shoes we have some pga golfers they take it upon themselves that they want the naboso insoles in their in their shoes so that's where we see some of the initial adoption is an athlete got injured 
That's usually the biggest <laughs> breaking down point, right? Like they get injured <laughs> and that's the athlete you can convert. The easiest is one that is injured and they realize that they are not unbreakable or whatever it is. Um, and that maybe they need to look at things a little bit differently. So if that's a starting point, let's just start there. But could we potentially have it further adopted? I, I really hope so. So now you've mentioned the Naboso. What are the benefits? What is Naboso first? What is Naboso technology? And what benefits uh, does it bring to the client and to the, to the coach? I had mentioned the nerves on the bottom of the foot where one of the nerves is sensitive to texture or two-point discrimination. So Nuboso is, I have them here, some of our new ones. Um, it's little dots set are across. There are little pyramids. I don't know if you can see that. There you go. Oh, yeah, we can see it. Um, that looks great. Cool. So they're little pyramids or little dots, almost like Braille. Think how Braille dots are, are on an ATM machine or something. And just imagine that across the entire surface, either across the entire um, mat, which I know you guys use at your facility, so mm -hmm. people might have seen it kind of encountered that way or it's on an insole we also have partner products and we sell sheets of our material so people would just like pimp out their facility on anything they want the material on but you have this two-point discrimination material that is stimulating the nerves in the bottom of the feet and the palm of the hand and that nerve that's sensitive to two-point discrimination is the most superficial. So it's actually the one that's the closest to whatever surface you're touching. And when you stimulate it, it increases foot awareness, hand awareness, body awareness. It activates the somatosensory cortex, which tells the brain slash body where you are in space. So that could be better balance, better force, um, faster joint position sense, um, you know, decreased risk of injury. We use a lot of people or have a lot of people that use it for a, like an anchor, meaning like, I feel that I am here in this room, if that makes sense, right? So it's like a safety thing, autonomic nervous system cue. Um, so we use it that, that way as well. Um, but we have some great results with professional athletes. If we kind of want to stay on that side, um, we have some um, Olympic athletes under track and field, U.S. shooting, pole vaults um, that have been using them, which is great. And then under medical and neuro rehab is our other big side that we use it with neuropathy as we've been speaking about a lot of people with spinal cord injuries, um, Parkinson's movement disorders, uh, if we go back to sports, people who had concussions, so it really helps with, you know, status post-concussion rehab. Oh, really? Um, really, really exciting stuff that we're doing a lot of research as much as we can and then, you know, trying to do what we can to raise funds so that we can support the research of what we're seeing. Well, because I remember when you brought out the prototype in New York City at your Barefoot Summit and we had the privilege of being there. And as soon as I stood on it, like my brain lit up. Like I, I couldn't tell you all the scientific clinical side of it, but all I knew is it felt good. And what kind of amused me was I was thinking, man, if you had this right next to your bed when you wake up in the morning and you set your feet down on it, like you'd be awake. There wouldn't be that lag of grogginess. Like you just stand on it, maybe twist your feet a little bit, corkscrew the floor and you're, you'd be like, boom, I am alert and I am awake. So I really love the feel of it right away. So yeah, I thought it was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, people do use it for that. I mean, we use it for standing desks also because of now this like, you know, post COVID people working at home. So we have a lot of people that get our standing mat and they put it when they're doing work. Um, and then aside kind of not Naboso related, but I remember having this patient when I was practicing off of just off of Wall Street here in New York City. And I had this high level um, patient and he was saying like my focus, my concentration, just like a little, like my work productivity is going down because I can't stay focused. And I'm starting to get like the big bosses are noticing and they're kind of pulling a little bit of work from me because of that. And I started him doing short foot, doing barefoot, barefoot at home, rolling his feet on a golf ball, a little cross ball, just kind of reconnecting to like the sensory proprioceptive side of the foot. And then I remember, I'll call it six, eight weeks later, he came back and he's like, you would not believe how much more focused I am at work. My concentration, my productivity went up again. And he was like, is that because of this? 
And I'm like, 100% you could make that connection because of everything that I was saying about why our kids need to not be in shoes. Um, so it's really cool to see that, that whether it's just foot and barefoot or it's Naboso at work or, or whatnot. Um, we actually had some uh, SWAT police officers use them and say that they actually noticed their, their focus when they're shooting. So we got them from U.S. shooting. So U.S. shooting team. If you've studied shooter, shooters as athletes, where I don't know if I, I don't know how they train as far as like athlete side. <laughs> I'm sure there's like a, like a lot of, you know, the accuracy of actually shooting, but I'm sure they have a lot of like autonomic nervous system control and like their breath control it's and stuff like that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where uh, my ex before my husband, he was an FBI sniper, like nope. under FBI SWAT sniper. So he was like, you have to be like pretty precise on that. Um, and he would tell me about the technique of the accuracy of a sniper shooter is that they are so in tune, like with their internal body and their breath and just the rhythm of their body that they shoot precisely in between a heartbeat. So they actually, it's really fascinating of that level. So the US shooters and then this SWAT police officer were really saying that it was easier for them to find that using the Naboso insoles. And I was like, that is, fucking awesome because i want to get a contract with the dod <laughs> so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there you go we'll use it with the military um but yeah like it's really interesting not, not even to just speak about nabosa but that's the importance of our feet yeah. like that's so cool uh, that's how important our feet are the more grounded you feel that affects so much within the body have you thought about putting that Naboso technology in. I mean, just think about all the places you stand every single day. So at the kitchen counter, like a kitchen mat or in the shower, a bath mat or something like that. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. Well, so we have people that will buy our standing mat and kind of use it like that. Okay. But we did have one company that wanted to try our material in the shower well, to see yeah, if you would be- actually stimulate, right? Um, and uh, Michael was supposed to try that. <laughs> <laughs> and test it out in our shower to see if it was like like will the glue work and not yeah. come off um is it really for the application of of like seniors so we were going to use it as a way yeah. to like stimulate seniors and reduce falls in a shower but also activate the feet at the same time which i do think that that would be awesome you just are going to have to have that in your shower because i wouldn't want people to slip so i would say to adhere it in the shower yeah you well, hope everyone takes a shower every day so <laughs> well it's it's funny because my mother-in-law lives with us and she's 80 plus but she now has to use our shower because it's a walk-in shower she can't use her shower anymore because she can't she's having hip, hip issues uh, so it's one of our concerns we said hey you have to use our shower now because we didn't want her because if we're not home and she falls over then who's going to be here to, so we said we had to transfer her over so uh that's something i would definitely be willing to do is experiment with that and put that in the bottom of the shower and see if uh, she gets okay. better feedback for that that'd be great cool I will, I will put a note down here to send you some, Dennis. I'm going to send right. you some material so you can play around with it in the shower. Yeah, um, well, that'd, be, that'd be great. I mean, yeah, I'd because, love to yeah, see and that that's works. where a lot of seniors are falling are in the shower. shower. Oh, because yeah. Obviously, the water is making it slippery. It's, an, it's a situation where they're barefoot, and a lot of people will push seniors into, like, you must be in shoes because they just think of, like, the rubber sole and they won't slip on something but then they completely feed the fact that they have no sensory input. So it's unfortunately a lot of seniors get worse the more they're in shoes like that. And it's so counterproductive. Let's change gears a little bit here with the, we had the whole Vibram lawsuit a few you know years back where the lady sued because she said the science was bunk and this, this shoe created this pain and injury for me. For people who are interested in be, in getting into barefoot training, what is a recommendation that you would give them as far as how to introduce themselves to it? Yeah, so this is the majority of my patients. So first thing I would say is that the barefoot running boom, which was now over 10 years ago, Yeah. Uh, but the yeah. barefoot running boom, which is the five fingers and like that whole kind of side, Nike free and all those, um, the when we say barefoot training, which is what you said, 
people should not go to barefoot running. Or even back then, 10 years ago, I was like, they're really not talking about running. It's just training. Like you don't, everyone thought like, oh, I had to run. If I wear Vibram or the five fingers, that means I have to run. I'm like, no, there's this thing called barefoot training <laughs> that, <laughs> that you can do. You don't have to run because you have those shoes. They're not running shoes per se. They're also training shoes, right? Um, so that's a, a thing that I always have to mention is like, the only thing to do barefoot is not running. You can also train, right? So let's say I want to start um, working out at your guys' facility barefoot. Let's say, how do I do that? Can I just like kick off my shoes? Um, I say that it's the one of the best environments and the easiest environments to start a barefoot uh, introduction is in a gym, like in, in a gym facility. So if you're going from traditional shoes to let's say minimal shoes, have your first minimal environment be the gym right? Like do that, like change your gym shoes to be minimal shoes or have your gym environment be barefoot and start without anything that is um, ballistic. So don't do jumping jacks and box jumps and sprinting around the gym barefoot because that's high impact, right? Mm -hmm. Do your squats, do your lunges, do your push-ups, whatever you do um, and do it barefoot, right? Do stick mobility barefoot, <laughs> All right? Yes, whatever they're yes. doing, Make sure you're doing it barefoot, right? Because you're you're not doing anything high impact, so it's it's safe. And then if you want to bump it up, then the longer that you're doing your non-impact workout barefoot, you can then start to slowly introduce something dynamic. Um, but as part of your your barefoot training, you want to start strengthening your foot, which is short foot. I mm -hmm. earlier. And you also want to make sure that you're integrating recovery. So the most important thing when you go from a traditional shoe environment to a minimal shoe environment or a barefoot training environment is that you have to balance stress and recovery. And if your stress goes higher, which it will because now you don't have the protection of the shoes, so your stress is going higher, right? That means you have to uptick your recovery so that you don't hit a threshold and get injured. That, that's literally as easy as it is. And then your recovery that you're upticking, you have several options. Do you want to myofascially release your feet? Do you want to ice your feet at the end of the day? Do you want to take anti-inflammatories? Do you want to do some sort of light therapy? Do you want to skip a day of exercising? Do you want to, right? Like there's a few things you could do that consider or fall under recovery so that you can offset that stress. I would say one of the most important that's probably underappreciated is allowing a 48 hour window of potential inflammation to show its face in a sense. Let's say barefoot running or training and you do Monday you work out and you're new to it and you don't know what the effects are gonna be of the stress. Tuesday you might feel awesome, but the inflammation hasn't hit its peak. So Wednesday, is might where you actually start to see some of the effects of your Monday workout. If you feel fine on Thursday, go at it again. You've cleared those that, that window. And then you reintroduce on Thursday the same stress you did on Monday, and then you kind of continue like that. And then if you feel fine, you can either take less time off in between or increase the stress you do on the day you work out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. That makes great okay. sense. Cool. Because I, I know when the very first time I bought a pair of Vibram Five Fingers, I wore them for just a couple hours, just walking around, just doing my usual gig. And the next day, I was absolutely amazed at how sore my calves were. And I was like, holy shit. Oh, yeah. I was like, are you kidding me? And that was really my light bulb moment there. I went, Wow. And, and people are like, well, how, and it's always the question, well, how far did you run? And I'm like, I didn't run. Like it took me three months of progressively increasing my, the amount of time that I wore those before I ever ran. And even the very first time I ran, I ran for just one minute. That's all I did. 
because I was more concerned about setting myself back. And not, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't over aggressive in my approach of, of training. Yeah. And if people are going to wear more minimal shoes, and this isn't even switching to like minimal um, shoes, like a Vibram or a Vivo Barefoot, it could be like here living in New York City, if people are going from more like winter shoe to now it's summer, okay. right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, flip flop season, right? So then they put their flip flop on and then they walk all over the city on the concrete just like they used to in their winter shoes. Technically, that was a transition uh, to a minimal shoe. Uh, and that's actually yes. why I see a lot of injuries. Yeah. Uh, people, that's a great call, point. people don't call flip flops, you know, minimal shoes, but technically they are. And a lot yeah. of these female yeah. ballet flats, they're minimal. Um, what is it? Toms? Like Toms are minimal, right? They're like, you can okay. bring them around. Bring them around yeah. Right? yeah. So there's a lot of shoes that are out there that don't fall under athletic minimal shoes that are minimal that a lot of our clients slash general consumers are wearing. No one calls them that, but that's what they are. That's a great point about the transition from winter footwear to summer. That's uh, I didn't even think okay, about yeah, that. We don't that, get that here. Yeah, yeah. We don't have that issue out here in California. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, whatever. You're not gonna have that. I- you're not gonna have that issue in Arizona either. Have that in Arizona. So. Yeah. <laughs> what one thing that I do like about having practiced in New York is it's such a walking culture. So what comes into my office practicing here is very different than what people see in other cities and states where it's primarily like a driving culture, Mm -hmm. right? And people don't do a lot here. I mean, my patients, so many of my patients, and especially when I was practicing full-time would have like 20,000 steps a day. Remember some of my construction patients, they'd be like, it's 12 o'clock, like noon. And they're like, Oh, I already took 20,000 steps. I'm like, how did you do that? Like, (laughs) I've only been up for two hours. Like it's you know, crazy, but it's, you just encounter different things that it's helped me to understand impact related injuries different than I think a lot of other podiatrist perspective per se is being here in New York city. And then I get to hear the patients firsthand saying, I just moved to Manhattan from Florida and now I have a stress fracture. I just moved to New York from whatever, Arizona, and now I have plantar fasciitis. I blah, 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 blah. And a lot of it is impact related and vibration and them going from, you know, a thousand steps to 10,000 steps even is a huge stress recovery. Just go back to that scale. Their stress went like this and they didn't understand recovery because they probably weren't doing anything for it. That that's why they got injured, right? Is that's yeah. all that they have to do is balance that. That's a good point. Cause I don't think we typically look at walking as, as load on the body, you know? Um, so that big jump from, yeah, a thousand steps to all of a sudden you're doing 15,000 steps. Like how much does your weight multiply every time you take a step? Is well, there... so it's one and a half times your body weight okay. when you're walking, right? Which may not seem like a lot, but one of the number one exercises for losing weight, picture someone who's like 300 pounds and needs to lose weight. The form of exercise that people choose primarily to lose weight is walking. Well, yeah. Like that's what they'll do. It's free. They don't have to pay anything. So if they're not like, they're not gym people, they're going to walk. That is what people do. They'll walk around the mall. So honestly, mall walking is just as hard as walking around New York City on all of the concrete because malls are concrete, right? So you could say in a suburban environment, the injuries that people are getting walking related are, you know, the, the same, like all these mall walkers. That'll be my new business in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the summertime there, that's you can't really do anything during the day. It's yeah, there's nothing else it, but go to the It's mall. brutal. Yeah, it's so hot I, out there. Yeah. It's really, yeah, it's really hot. It's gonna be you quite. Would, you would die. I would die. Yeah. No, I've gotten better. Okay, when we were in Bali, <laughs> I mean, I was dying. We were well. You you were that. We were. I was like, oh my god. I'm like, you've <laughs> got I've to be kidding me. Ask about Dubai. Who went to oh, Dubai? It's Dennis. hottish. So, yeah. and I wasn't even there during the hottest time of the year. I was there in June and they're like, oh, you think this is bad? You should come back in August. And I'm like, why the hell would I do that? I'm like, this is already hot as hell. And people are wearing jeans and suits 
I was like, yeah. what is, are you kidding? No big deal. Yeah. I mean, I'm in shorts and a t-shirt and I'm dying. And these people are like in jeans, jackets. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but they yeah. just, you know. I was there early September. So I, I caught kind of like the height of it. Oh, and okay. Like, I love going to Bali and Southeast Asia, and you go to the beach or to the ocean, so, right? They have, like, their mm-hmm. lake or whatever. And I, like, go out five minutes there. I'm like, hell no. Like, back <laughs> in. I do not like shopping malls. Like, I just, the New Yorker in me just, like, hates shopping malls, like, commercialization like that. Um, but, yeah, when I was in Dubai, I was like, to the mall, please. So, so I was like, there was nothing else to do. And that's it's what's crazy. funny is because people ask, they're like, why are there the, the malls in Dubai? And I'm like, when you figure out how hot it is, you now understand why their malls are the way they are. They're, that's where people go, right? It's I mean, that's like Singapore too. Yeah, it's their entertainment center, to be honest with you. That's where they do yeah. everything. Yeah. And so, Actually, a lot of Southeast Asia, they all have malls. In Jakarta, there's like 10 giant malls. Oh. Yeah, in Jakarta, uh, Nano was with me, and he's like, that's a mall, that's a mall. From my hotel room, he's like, that's a mall, that's a mall, that's a mall. I looked at him, I'm like, what? I'm like, do you do, you do anything else over here other than shop? Yeah, it's really fascinating to see how many malls are in other countries when you when you do travel and experience that. It's, it's been very yeah. eye-opening. And gyms are in malls. Like here in the yes. U.S., gyms aren't in shopping malls. Right. But oh. it'll be like, oh, randomly on the third floor of this ginormous shopping mall is a huge 10,000 square foot facility or whatever. And you're just, I don't even know if 10,000 square feet is big. Right. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. It, it, it's a very world gyms. I'm like, I'm, they're like, oh yeah, you're going to be training at world gym. It's on the fifth floor, the fifth floor. It's not a freestanding structure on its own. They're like, no, it's, it's in this yeah. mall. So let's switch over to more of the business side because you are an entrepreneur. Have you kind of always had that in, in instinct, so to speak, of being an entrepreneur? Mm. Or is it something that you were just like... <laughs> Like, I, I didn't sell, like, stamps when I was five. And, like, you know, some people have, like, stories like that. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I had this little, you know, baseball card collection and made, you know, whatever. Like, I don't have any, any stories like that. Um, but I did grow up in an entrepreneurial household mm-hmm. that my father is an entrepreneur. So I grew up around that and that work ethic of what it is to own your own company. Um, his father, so my grandfather, was also an entrepreneur. So it's kind of um, around that as well. And then my older sister is an entrepreneur. So I think that I just kind of, from an early age, age 21, I got into personal training. And then even though I went back to um, medical school and stuff, I constantly knew that it's like your your own kind of entrepreneur. Even if you work for a commercial gym, you are quasi an entrepreneur because you're managing your your client schedule and you're trying to recruit and you're, you know, there's a whole strategy and how you can grow your personal great personal training business within a gym. And that, yeah, I, I realized that I never wanted to work for anyone, which is why I went to medical school. And when I graduated and I started working for a practice, I made sure it was on my terms, <laughs> not their terms. Um, I was never full-time salaried ever I'm 40 now, ever. I've never been full-time salaried by anyone. Um, that when I would practice, it would be under kind of independent terms because I was traveling the world for EBFA and teaching education. Um, and then very early on in my medical career practicing, I started getting approached from like a consultant perspective and started realizing that there's so much more you can do with a degree than just nine to five, you know, Uh, I only make money based off of how many patients I see and there's only so many hours a day. So it's just like simple calculation of how much you potentially could earn in a sense um, that I just knew that you could do a lot more with the degree. And um, I do have podiatrists or medical colleagues who try to then mimic what I'm doing just meaning like I'm a brand, right? Mm-hmm. Like my mm-hmm. social media is a brand. Mm-hmm. Um, everything I put out, whatever I speak 
about my blogs, the books I write, everything I'm constantly thinking about like a larger potential of scale. And they try to do that 10 years in, you can't, you can't just suddenly, right? <laughs> you know, like yeah. my, my brand is 12 to 14. No, no. Cause 2008, I launched Catwalk Confidence like 12, 13 years in the making, always thinking forward, bigger brand, no ceiling over you. I will never work for anyone (laughs) but myself. There are probably people listening right now who are maybe thinking about it, maybe having some hesitancy because it's a huge risk to start your own business. Uh, Is there, are there any recommendations that you would give a somebody who is kind of thinking about doing this, launching their their own company or their own brand? Yes. So it it depends on the type of brand or company, right? So there is, you can be an entrepreneur and essentially be a brand, right? Like, so you're, you're the brand. And now I, I've started mentoring, you know, young entrepreneurs or the next generation of entrepreneurs and they'll have their company, but then they'll have their company name and then, them and they'll have people follow them on let's say instagram but then they have a company page and they're trying to build the company page but then they just keep putting all the energy into them as as the brand so it's like are you the business or is your facility the business like you just have to really differentiate like what is your business where with myself me as a brand is one business just dr emily it's not even my medical practice it's just me and my brand is a business so i have a publicist for my business i have a instagram social media person for my business which is just my brand and then i have a products company and then i have an education company or theoretically that's like a service company right and they're all managed very different so you, you want to first really differentiate who slash what is the business. If you want to be the next superstar that is, you know, speaking at Idea World and, and things like that and having a bajillion followers for your workout that you create, then you, you really want to differentiate what that is. Um, and then I have people who, especially here in COVID, will say, okay, I, I lost my job or I was furloughed or something like that. So this is now the time to kind of like do my own thing because it's the opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say if they want to do something in senior fitness, senior fitness is, or functional aging fitness is becoming kind of crowded. So how do you stand out within a crowded space? Is your next step after really determining what your business is, meaning you slash your company, The second one is you have to do a very, very, very detailed competition analysis and you need to know your competitors and then say, okay, all of these people are doing, you know, senior fitness, but I'm going to come in and be the neuropathy specialist, whatever. Right. And then, but there's a few other people who are doing neuropathy. So I'm going to really look at what they're doing and how they word it and their branding and their name, and then make sure that I'm differentiating myself and standing um, apart from them. So you have to kind of understand the, the competition. And then third is really having the, knowing the market, knowing the problem, like a lot of businesses, problem solution focused. Right. So Mm -hmm. are you solving a problem? Right. So what is the problem? What is the pain point? Um, Naboso recently was part of a business accelerator that I got to learn business in a way that I never had looked at it before. And it was more like problem solution focused. Right. So Mm -hmm. which applies within fitness as well is the problem is you have all of these women who don't have access to, you know, uh, swimming based programs or whatever. I don't know. Right. And then you want to kind of solve the problem. So problem solution, and then knowing the market and then knowing the competition and then knowing the brand is what I would say that a lot of the, the biggest thing is, and then you just have to be consistent with it. Um, uh, what I did with EBFA and what I really think allowed EBFA to grow where for the, the listeners who don't know EBFA global EBFA is an education company where we have certifications under it, but it's, it's, it's also a content company. So it's, it's all we do is content. And some of the content we give away for free, 
some of the content we sell, obviously, but I do um, lectures at conferences. I do free webinars. I go to facilities like every Equinox in the U.S. I've been to and given lectures and right. So it's, it's just content. If you're given an opportunity or an invitation to speak and there's not always a compensation to it, there's still a benefit to it. So what is the what is the asset you can get out of it? So if I gave a lecture at Equinox for free and there's 30 people in the room, I'll do it for free. But guess what? I get 30 email addresses, right? That's Mm -hmm. that's really what I own. EBFA has its revenue, but the the brand equity or what it actually owns, right? Like Nabosa is the product. Like there's, you know, $500,000 worth of product behind me. What EBFA owns or has that is beneficial are all of the email addresses. So my contact list is the most important thing under EBFA. So a lecture I give, if I'm at Ideal World, I am trying to get every single person in that audience their email address. I need them to follow me. But if they follow me on Instagram or Facebook and Facebook wants to be like, delete. (laughs) (laughs) They could just be like, sorry, technical glitch. My company, this is something that, that people need to think about who are so like, I'm an Instagram celebrity. Facebook could just be like, fuck you. Right. You yeah. have nothing then. What, yeah. what, do you, what does your company have? Right. Mm-hmm. So you, you constantly want to think about that. And I've, I've always told my team that the most important thing you can get out of that encounter is their contact information. Hands down. Yeah. That's my, my business one one <laughs> for you right now. <laughs> yeah. I think we've talked about that where like, what if Instagram went away tomorrow? How would your business survive? What if your biggest platform just goes away? Like, what would you do? Yeah. 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 And that's where the contacts are huge and, and the credibility you've built with the books, with everything. Yeah. Oh. Being a content driven company. So that's the thing that a lot of, you know, trainers and coaches and movement specialists. So, you know, we're here. So we're in the middle of COVID, um, although people are starting to go back, but you have your one on one. Um, maybe you're doing virtual classes, right? But every other person's doing virtual classes. They're all free. They're all free on Facebook. You see all them all. So why is someone going to do your workout? And if you want to charge because you need to make money and pay your rent, I get it. But why the fuck would I pay you when theirs are free? Like, right? So you want to like really, 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 really differentiate yourself. And then before you sell something, oh, I'd say this is one of the best business books is um, Gary Vaynerchuk's uh, jab, 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 hook, which is essentially free shit, free shit, free shit, charge them, right? And, and not in like a sales way, but I did so many free webinars before I actually charged for a webinar. So if I have only 100 email addresses and I'm trying to sell something to 100 people, mm-hmm. no, you, you need like big pool to then right, say it, but they also don't know you. If people don't know you or, or trust what you're saying, why would they pay you when there's so much free stuff that's out there? Yeah, yeah. Right? So your, your differentiation, what you guys do at, at Stick Mobility is in addition to being a product company, you have an exercise library, right? And then now you're doing a podcast. So this is information, right? So you've mm-hmm. kind of content information exercises content, right? Some people will do a blog, but you have to – your brand is consistent through all of those, not your brand Dean, but your brand, your message, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like your, your, your message of kind of connecting to your body and intention and, and, and things like that has to be very clear for people. And then people see you as a resource. They trust you. They like your product. So they're going to trust if you write a blog. Very true. It's the same thing of what well, Kelly Starrett did the same thing. You put all that free content out there. Yes, he had the book, but then think about how much free content he put out there. And then when he released his paid content, when he switched over to paid, yes, a lot of people that were used to the free content dropped off, but he still had a very hardcore fan base that Mm -hmm. found the value and saying, okay, I'm still willing to now pay for 
get your paid content because I see that value because you've given me all this free content and whether it's, it's maybe a little bit of loyalty tied in there, but they value that person just like you said. So it's, it's for the listeners out there, they're kind of thinking about doing stuff like this. This is information that we want you to hear and, and, really consider to utilize, to be honest, that's what we're really trying to give you is some advice from people that are, are out there and doing this. Um, anytime you start your own business, it is a massive risk. I, I think about how many people don't start a business because they're just, a, they don't want to take that step off the diving board, so to speak. They, they, and, and how much, how much we, are we missing out on people not taking that risk who may have made a huge difference in, in, in a ton of lives simply because they didn't want to take that jump? Uh, 100%. Right? And, and entrepreneurial, being an entrepreneur, as you guys can, can vouch as well, is um, it's a hard job. Mm-hmm. And they will always say that it is like lonely on top kind of thing you know not meaning that you it's you don't have peers within but you know it is like the buck stops with you and the larger the company when something kind of breaks or doesn't go wrong it falls right back on you you can't turn to blame someone there's not like a colleague or your boss like you have to like kind of put on like big girl or boy pants and like really own up to what it yeah. means to be an entrepreneur is there a an op a big obstacle that you came across or encountered that maybe caught you off guard when you in your business world that you kind of didn't take into account that maybe the listeners out there can aren't thinking of or may not have an understanding of what i encounter a lot are uh, (laughs) people who will take my information (laughs) copycats um and that is uh, one of the most frustrating things. That what I would say is that if you are creating something that is inspired off of someone else, like let's just say Kelly Starrett's work, right? Mm-hmm. And you say, I love this mobility sequence he does. Referencing your network or mentors is goes down like so well for you when you might think there's probably no one in this audience that will know exactly that I got you never know like there's always Mm -hmm. someone who knows someone who's seen something and then with social media like I've had people post something in a lecture right like a they're in the class and they take a picture of the projection Mm -hmm. and it's like my shit up there Uh that I I don't know the person directly who was speaking of it but they're taking my stuff right and with, with social media and the internet, like just stuff gets out. So I would always just say, you always want to reference your resources and you just don't want to do like dirty business. Um, people who ride coattails for the sake of themselves, never, never win, <laughs> <laughs> never, never bode well um, that you just always want to have like, like moral and business ethic on it and do stuff, you know, genuine Um, people who are in business for just to make a ton of money. Usually you can kind of screen those out versus really just trying to do good. Um, And then uh, with Nabo, so we've had some copycats and, you know, I've sent a few legal cease and desist letters where my lawyer has. Um, But the only thing that you can do is hold true to your brand, your consistency, and continuously evolve under EBFA. So we started as feet and barefoot because I'm a podiatrist and, and the movement, but then we kind of got into fascial. Then I started talking about breathing and then pelvic floor. Then I went into t- interoception and then I'm talking about brain and how that connects. And then I, you kind of has, you have to constantly evolve. If you stay static, then, um, kind of things people can kind of like blow by you. So you have to be always first. <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's what it is. So now other people are like talking about feed. There's people on um, social media that have way more followers than I do. And part of me is like, that's not fair, but I'm constantly evolving my message that I don't want to be just the foot person. Mm-hmm. And that's all that I do because that's not how I look at the body. I'm a continuous student. So they can keep talking about 
supination and pronation. To me, that's like so five years ago that I would rather <laughs> like go This is Emily's like internal struggle where I'm just like, bitch, are you really talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but no, I try to continuously evolve so that there's no ceiling over my head. And when you start to get a little static, then you can't. Um, in the case of Noboso and, and people who try to mimic or copycat, there's certain like legal things that you just can't, you can't get around that. And I don't know if you've seen that with stick mobility yet, but think of like whole body vibration. Like there's now several companies that do whole body vibration and power plate, maybe they have slightly different vibration, right? but they're all still vibration mm -hmm. where power plate, we get pissed at, you know, vibro plate and those Galileo and some of these other ones. The only thing that those companies can do is stay true to their message and make sure that they're constantly being consistent in that message and then evolving to stay one step ahead from the competition in a sense. So your job is never, never done as an entrepreneur. Can't stop. I just, I just sure. saw this like, last night. I mean, someone literally copied our box and like, I mean, it's so, it'll be a fun lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I come across a lot of people that there's so many facets to owning your business. I mean, just even as something as simple as opening up your own training facility. I talked to train coaches are like, I want to own my own facility. And I'm like, okay, here are the costs that are associated with this. And you start rattling off the costs and their eyes just keep big, getting bigger and bigger and bigger because all they thought was lease and equipment. That's all they had. And you're like, no, 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 no. There is this cost, this cost, this cost, this cost. And they're like, oh. And that then all is, the extra hours you need to put in too. Right. right? And yeah. the sweat equity, the sweat equity has got to be there because that's so much of it. And so when you start to really delve into uh, trying to help burgeoning uh, business owners, it is, it's very eye opening to see how kind of business naive they are. And, and I was there too. I mean, I was in the same boat. I mean, when I opened up my own first facility, I was like, holy crap, there's way more to this than I would have ever thought. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, if, if you are thinking about starting your own business, reach out to someone who has that experience. Reach out to several people who have been in the game for quite a while and really either whether you're using them as a mentor, but try to learn from their experiences so that you're not uh, running into a lot of roadblocks. So you don't have to experience those things the hard way, so to speak. So. Yeah. Well, one thing that I would also add with that is you also want to think of what is the bigger goal of the business? And this I've learned a lot through Naboso because Naboso is very different than EBFA. EBFA, I don't have any investors. I have um, master instructors, mm -hmm. but really it's, it's what they would call like a lifestyle business. Like I would never sell the company, right? There's a lot of IP that I sell through it, but I would never say like, okay, here you're buying, you know, the corporation and then I like bow out of it because it, I, I could, but that's not my goal with it. With Naboso, it's very different. Granted, it's also a product company, but we have investors. The goal is to be acquired. So it's, you, you really want to understand what is your goal with it? Mm -hmm. Do you want to open a facility and you are the only trainer and that's your independent training facility and that's it. That's the business model, right? Mm -hmm. That's very different than um, that's kind of like you just make your money that covers your life fix, your salary in mm -hmm. a sense. Or do you want to kind of scale it a little bit so that you could like take a vacation, <laughs> right? Or something like that. Do you want trainers under you? Different business model. You have to kind of think of that from the get-go, do you want to start it and then maybe franchise it? Totally different business model, right? So you wanna think of, you know, really what is the business model from like day one? I don't know how many, you know, fitness professionals are actually doing a business plan. That's obviously not taught in training school. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think not that even goes. I don't want to know like, like what the goal is. I mean, that's why they have really good um, like masterminds. Like Todd Durkin is like 
fucking amazing at business. Like he's mm-hmm. just like scaled. He's a brand, right? His mm-hmm. business is him. He has his masterminds and his mentorship and um, he writes and he speaks and blah, 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 blah all that stuff. Like he's scaled uh, the business of what he wants to do within the industry where we kind of want to think versus just reacting to stuff like, oh, oh, why don't I do this? Like kind of just where do you, where do you picture it? And you don't have to follow it. It's not like scripture. And if you don't follow your business plan, you fall off the world or something. I don't know. But <laughs> you want to have an idea versus going in like what, what you were saying about blindly because running a business is, it's still business and you need to know you need no taxes and Mm. like who's going to keep track of your books dennis's wife could but (laughs) (laughs) a lot of people don't think of that also they're just like well i just kind of like keep track in like a ledger maybe they have a quickbooks online but you you want to think of those things early on and have all those eyes dotted versus reacting to something have it you know Preactive in a sense. Um, there's a lot of really good um, business programs. So there, for any of the women that are listening, sorry, YouTube, but there's a lot of women, <laughs> women business opportunities. Um, there's also a lot of minority opportunities of um, like programs. So mm-hmm. either minority owned owned businesses, they have like business accelerators almost, kind of little programs to the Small Business Association. You can find those in almost every city, every state has them. And then they have like programs you can be part of and like groups. Um, I went through one um, not too long ago and it was great every week. And we went through like an accelerated business um, school essentially because I don't have an MBA, but it, it essentially knocks off things so that you feel like you have more, you know, business knowledge or business verbiage that you can use. Um, so people could look for stuff like that as well. And that's just on the small business um, association mm-hmm. website. Yep. Yep. Oh, so they'll cool. have like, it's a mini accelerator. I think this one was called growth venture. So you have to, some of them, you have to be doing a certain amount of revenue or you could be pre revenue for some um, there's fees for them, but it's not, it's not a high fee for, it could be like a three month program for $500 or something like that. Oh, but yeah. it, it gets you kind of uh, within accountable group or network um, I wish they had more of this for, for fitness, honestly. I wow. wish that idea, I had a branch that was under it or something like that for for new businesses, especially now, you know, post-COVID, because there's going to be a lot of new um, entrepreneurs now, like seeking independent opportunities because of, of uh, certain situations um, that you want to be guided so you feel confident and you don't run into anything. And if Again, what you don't know, you don't know. So it's not the fault of the new entrepreneur. So people can reach out to me if they want. Maybe I'll start. Fantastic. Well, yeah, no, it's true. Mentoring other people in the. (laughs) One of my biggest things that I wish was around when I got into the industry twenty plus years ago was on the tax and budgeting side. You know how to not. Everyone wants to tell you how to get clients. I can get you business. Well, great. That's awesome. But what am I going to do when I get it? How do I manage my books? How? Do, what is Uncle Sam going to want from me? What is my state going to want from me? Because that is really what's going to make or break your business. And so I, I wish, it's like you said, IDA or somebody would have some type of and unfortunately, it's not sexy. That's, I think, the biggest reason is, is it's just not sexy to market. But it's such a crucial, vital thing. So, and I, I wish they had, the people were offering that and how to manage your business. So, that way you can thrive because I think that's one of the biggest reasons why we see, especially independent trainers, they break out of a box gym, which has been providing them all their business and their paycheck. And then they break out on their own. They're like, I can do this. And then- they're like, oh, shit. Later, they're like, they're oh, like no, I, I and they it. drop off or they yeah. have to go back to the box gym that they were originally at in the first place. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm right with you on that one. I, I wish the industry would have some type of, of, uh, struct, of support for the back end side, the not so glamorous side of, of, of having your own business. But the most vital part, to be very honest with you. So, yeah. And right now, I mean, yeah. you've got over you probably have over 200 big box gyms closing around the nation so you've got 
however many trainers out of work and i mean this is exactly what they need right now yeah so yeah i mean you probably have what say 20 trainers in each one 20 that's like what four thousand. so it's been kind of eye-opening about yeah. how many trainers are actually out of certain facilities even with equinox i'm kind of blown away by how many coaches they have at each location i'm like how do you support that? But well, I don't think all of them are full time either. So a lot have, like, of part time. Yeah, you know the busy hours. You have the morning, three hours in the morning, two hours in the evening. So you have you know forty trainers that are working five hours a day, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, that's where you could. This is what I would see it as is okay. There's now four to we'll, make, we'll call it even five to six thousand trainers that now don't have a position in a big box. This is across the states. Um, so maybe how many in my city, I they're going to need somewhere to take their clients, right? Because maybe the client doesn't feel comfortable. So I'm going to open a independent training facility. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that would be someone looking at the situation, seeing the need that they need to fill is where are these trainers going to train that from day one is set up uh, social distanced. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right that like it's built it's built for the current normal of what facilities and people are looking for with certain air, air purification techniques on the machines and we only have whatever materials don't hold on to viruses or i'm just making this up mm -hmm. but you know something like a flooring system that has silver impregnated in it because silver is antimicrobial. Like that's that's how I would do it. If someone takes that idea, can you please just call it the Emily Gym? <laughs> <laughs> Any new things coming out that you got big plans gearing up for the end of 2020, rolling into 2021, or other than your move, um, you got the move. Yeah, out of my move. Um, yeah. So for EBFA, we're launching a new certification or certificate program. Um, that is on interoception. So it's the interoceptive performance specialist. So we'll be launching that initially online. And then I'm writing a book with a publishing house. It's a UK based publishing house, but they're, they're global. Um, they have a US based one. So I'm writing that as well. That's on intero and extero sensory. So I'm doing that. Um, we have a new product partnership that I cannot disclose with Naboso. Um, but that is coming out as well in the fall. We are launching a new website for Naboso um, July, middle of July. And we have new branding. I can show you the stuff now. We have new, this is our color schematic. Oh, oh, oh nice. Where's the orange no. one? <laughs> out. Uh, yeah, so new, new branding, a new insole that's coming out as well. Um, some new exciting partnerships under Naboso. Uh, yeah, doing some research and blah, 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 lots of stuff that we're, we're doing. Fantastic. Well, as always, it's a privilege talking to you. Uh, we love everything that you do for us and, and everything, the message, the stuff that you teach. If you're not following Dr. Emily, you need to get on board. Uh, do you want to give the listeners your social media outlets so they can jump on if they, if they don't know what those are? Sure. Uh, so on Instagram, um, I'll, I'll just primarily give Instagram. So it's um, Dr. Emily DPM. So Dr. Emily DPM is my personal one. EBFAs is EBFA underscore barefoot education. We're on Facebook as well. And then Naboso is Naboso underscore technology. And then we're on YouTube. Um, obviously LinkedIn. I don't know if people go on LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> Facebook, I used, YouTube. Uh, I see messages on there, but I don't, I don't really use it that much. It's, it's uh, rare that I ever go on LinkedIn. I didn't yeah, use it. It's to be like the new hot thing to be yeah, on. Yeah, I guess so. Actually, no, I'm sorry. TikTok is, but for 40 year olds. Oh, like, oh we've <laughs> tried to figure out TikTok and I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm I need to hire, hire a 12 year old to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel like, I feel like you have to dance to be on TikTok. I'm sure that's not true at all, <laughs> but that's my impression. That's the 40 year old's impression that TikTok is a dancing app. So yeah, it's pretty humorous just to see like people like us just yeah. trying to figure out. Hey, Gary V says you need to be on there. So I guess uh, I know, I know. I mean, I feel that if you're targeting people who are younger right now, I'm sure it'll change. But you know, a lot of our users for Nabosa are actually more on Facebook because they're like 55, 60, 65, right? So they're a little yeah. bit older. So you actually 
you need to know your audience yep. and then yep. target to it. If I was targeting millennials, I'd probably be on TikTok too. Mm. And those young ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you again, Dr. Emily, for joining us. We, since you're going to be out in Arizona, we will probably see more of each other a little bit more frequently. So we look forward to your next uh, Barefoot Summit. So thank you very much. We look forward to having you on as a regular guest, if you wouldn't mind. If you would, we'd love to have you on. Yeah, I love hanging out with you guys. You, you gave me energy. I feel energized right. now. Like I so thank you. <laughs> so say hello to the family. Say hello to Michael. And we will talk soon. So all righty. Take care. All right. Thank Talk you. To you later. Bye-bye. Bye.